Welcome back, Obsessives. Welcome to another exciting edition of the Comic Obsessive. This is episode 29. As always, I don't think it's changed yet. My name is Jason Dehart, and I'm joined by... I'm Adam Piles, but we're joined by someone very special today. Yes, yes, absolutely. The the one, the only, the legend, wait for it, Derry, uh, Mr. Tom DeFalco. May I call you Mr. DeFalco? Is that okay? <laughs> You can call me whatever you want to call me. <laughs> right. um, you know, being in the comic book industry for so many years, I, you know, answer to many names. <laughs> uh, most of them not appropriate for your readership. <laughs> That's the life of the editor, I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> so be it. Well, we are really pleased uh, to have you on this podcast. I'm I'm very pleased to have you on this podcast, even honored, because I've been reading your work since I was 10 years old with uh, <laughs> this one right here. You were 10 years old when that came out? I believe I was 10 years old. I believe this was 88. What issue no, number 89. is that, Adam? 89. 89. Nice. Yeah, so I was 11. So this is uh, 404. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so I started my journey with Mr. DeFalco in 1989, and I haven't looked back. It was a it was a wonderful issue. It freaked me out. The <laughs> the uh, whole like this scene right here where uh, they go underneath, and um, Annihilus has everybody in the cocoons and everything like that. That was great. That was wonderful <laughs> stuff. <laughs> that made me a fan right from the beginning. Uh, I, I, I'm glad that's, you know, the, Ron Friends could transport people, you know, into the, into the craziest scenes. His, his artwork is, is just so, you know, so great. He's such a, an incredible visual storyteller that he, he sucks everybody in. He, he really does. Well, uh, Jason, do you want to start us off with a with a good question? Sure. I, I think that transitions right into the first question we shared with you about uh, working with Ron Friends in particular. So I know that comics are collaborative. Uh, what What's that collaboration been like for you with uh, Mr. Friends? Oh, it's been great. He does all the work and I get all the credit. It's fabulous. <laughs> ideal. <laughs> ideal. That's what we do around here. That's what we do around here. Adam does the work. I get the credit. It's fantastic. Yeah, yeah that's that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, Ron and I established early on a, um, a way of working together where we, we, we have no ego. We just throw out ideas and, um, you know, sometimes, you know, I approach him and say, hey, I've got a great idea for a story. And I start explaining it to him. And he says, yeah, that's great. How about if we do this? And how about if we do that? And the next thing I know, the original idea that I had is tossed in the garbage because we've come up with like 10 much better ideas. Um, and, you know, the, the secret in any creative endeavor is you, you have to be an idea factory. You, you've got to come up with you know, hundreds of ideas, and you can't be wedded to any of them because there's always a better idea right around the corner, and you, and you just have to be open to, to those ideas when they come. Um, you know, Ron and I have, you know, occasionally got to the point where I, I say, yeah, I like your idea better. And he goes, no, 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 I like your idea better. <laughs> and then we realize we have to come up with a third idea that we like, you know, both of us like even, even better than than that. And... Uh, it is, it has been a real, real privilege and an honor to be able to work with Mr. Friends for so many years. Um, it, it, you know, in many regards, he's my best friend. Uh, you know, uh, we, we've been collaborating now, now, I guess for, I guess it's close to forty years. Wow. And uh, you know, if if you know Marvel ever called us up and wanted to put us on something, yeah, we'd collaborate for another. 40 years if we, if we had, <laughs> had it in this. <laughs> would you find that um, like even the arc of a story would change, not just changes, you know, per issue, but like the ending of the arc that you kind of mapped out would change based on your collaboration? Oh, constantly. We're, we're, oh, okay. we're, we're constantly making changes. Um, yeah, I, I often say this, I am a devout coward. <laughs> and I, 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 I hesitate to start a story in, unless I know how it ends. Um, but 
many a time we, you know, Ron and I started uh, started a particular story, and then as we're working together, we came up with better endings. Right. Um, and like like I said, you, you got to be flexible. You got to move move in those directions. So we, uh, you know, we often uh, surprised each other going forward. Well, it was really fun seeing both of you at Heroes Con, uh, both this year and last year. <clears throat> well, it was it was great seeing you guys just together, because like you say, in my mind, you do go together, like because of, <laughs> because of Thor and Thunderstrike. I'm a huge Thunderstrike fan. Um, well, you should be. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was. I was so uh, bummed out the first year you were supposed to be there. It got canceled <clears throat> because of COVID, and then uh, I was I was really like you two were the ones I was really you were all at the top of my list. And then when I saw you were coming back the next year, ah, it was, it was a blast. And that's when you actually ended up signing my, my 404 here. And, uh, um, I think my Thunderstrike, my Thunderstrike number one, you signed, uh, you and Mr. Friend signed that for me as well. Well, I'm glad we could be there. Um, yeah, you know, heroes, I, I, I was there last year. I was there this year, and it's a, it's a great convention, you know. Um, and everybody is so friendly there, which as a New Yorker, I find very suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> it, it does have that reputation for being just a like calm and chill environment where everybody just seems to be happy to be there. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, I I love love the fact that I get to. You know, run into a lot of old friends. Had you been, um, had you been at Heroes Con before last year? Um, yeah, in, in the early '80s. Oh wow! <laughs> okay. Oh man. So, uh, yeah, I went there. You know, I, I think once. You know, many many years ago. Okay. And, and, and I was very impressed. Uh, you know, with Sheldon then, and and I still am. <laughs> yeah. So it's a, it's a great convention. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jason, did you want to talk to him about Secret Wars here? Sure, I'd be glad to. Uh, I know <laughs> that uh, over the past year, you've revisited the world of Secret Wars and really enjoyed that uh, miniseries run with Pat Olive. I'm, I'm curious what that was like to get back into uh, a world that you were part of so long. Or, or did you ever leave, really? <laughs> <laughs> um yeah I, I i left that i i never came back for secret wars uh secret wars 2 um it, it, i remember when the editor got in touch with me and, and said we wanted we want you to do a direct sequel to the secret wars and i said we, we did one it was called secret wars 2 <laughs> he says no we, we, we're looking for an untold story connected to the original secret wars and I said to him, what? I said, that story's got to be 30 years old. And then he corrected me. He said, it's 40 years old. <laughs> and I, I said to him, 40, you know, that's, that's older than most of, you know, most of your readers have been alive. And, and, uh, and, and then I found my, uh, my uh, editor was in his 30s. So, <laughs> um, but, but the challenge to do a, a story um, that's connected with something 40 years ago uh, and still make it you know uh, relevant to the to, to today's readers um, and and put in some seeds like the original secret war had many seeds that uh, here it is you know 40 years later people are still mining those seeds so I, I had to plant some seeds into this thing so that 40 years from now, somebody else can do a seed. I mean, it, right. it, 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 it was a real challenge. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm still a sucker whenever I, whenever I face a challenge and think, you know, how the heck are you supposed to do that? I, I, I know I'm always suckered in. I, I you know, I'm, I'm going to do, take that assignment. Oh, yeah. Did you know that uh, Marvel was putting out the Secret Wars again? Now they have like pretty chrome covers and uh, they're releasing all the issues again. I think they're issue up to like issue five or six, maybe. Yeah, I, I'm aware of that now. At the time I started working on this, I was not aware of that. 
Um, I, I remember when they told me, oh, yeah, we're going to you know, reprint, you know, your run from that year, you know, 252. And I said, oh, we're going to reprint 252 again. And they said, yeah, uh, and, and the rest of the year. And I said, what, what, all, all 12 of them? What, why would you do that? <laughs> uh, um, I, you know, I, I hope they're selling. <laughs> I, I can't. <laughs> it's... Uh, it just seems like comics have such a timeless quality. You know what I mean? Like um, you, you talk about this story being 40 years old, but people still know it and people still love it. And people still buy, buy those issues again, those reprints to experience it again. It's still homaged in a ton of different ways. And comics just seem to have a timeless quality about them. And I don't know, it must be fun to work in that type of industry where things are timeless. Well, you know, I've always said that comic books have one of two values. Either the, the comic book, you know, reaches out and, and you know, causes an, an emotional reaction within you. And, and then it's a priceless comic book. Or it doesn't, and then it's worthless. And I don't, you know, care what the price guides say. Those, 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 that's always been my criteria. Uh, priceless. Priceless. Sorry. 404. Priceless. <laughs> now, this now. One, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Adam. Oh, I, I was just going to geek out a little bit more with Mr. DeFalco and say <laughs> priceless. <laughs> <laughs> New Warriors, priceless. Um, is fantastic stuff. I interrupted you, Jason. What were you going to say? I, I was just going to say Adam recommended issue 444 which was a Christmas issue. That's something we both read uh, kind of as a, as a background, but uh, curious about any particular issues that are among your favorites. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. When I heard from you guys I, about things that were my favorites, I, I, um, I think in the, 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 the second part of the, um, the black galaxy saga, mm -hmm. um, there's a, a scene at the at the end of the issue where um, Eric Masterson is going to meet with his uh, ex-wife, uh, and they've been fighting over custody of the son. And Eric knows he's he's going with Thor on this mission, which is probably a suicide mission. So he uh, he gives up custody of his son, and. Um, uh, you know, uh, everybody's surprised. Hercules is there at the time. And um, and then after his uh, ex-wife walks out, um, Eric collapses in Hercules' arms. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's a scene that Ron and I worked very heavy on. And uh, I, I, I think it still has a strong emotional, it has a strong emotional impact on me at this yeah. stage of the game. Yeah, I, I, I got to admit, like, I know exactly the scene you're talking about. I remember that. And like, I read that. I don't think I read that at the time. That was not one that I picked up when I was 10 or 11, but I picked it up later and I read it. And yeah, just the emotion in that scene was so real. And just to, you know, heap a ton of compliments on you, like, you know, bringing in Eric Masterson and, and his son, Kevin, and like the, the situation with his ex-wife and everything, this was stuff I had like no real concept of in, in terms of story. You know what I mean? Like I'd never really seen that much in a story, but even as like an 11, 12 year old, I was totally invested in all of that. And that just really speaks to how well you and Mr. Friends crafted that and, and put the emotion in there. It was just, uh, I was reading stuff I didn't really understand. <laughs> I mean, I, under, I understood it, but you know what I mean? I didn't have any association with it, no context for it. Mm -hmm. um, but going back and reading it as an adult, I look back and think just how serious it was. And just, uh, I don't know, like you say, the emotion that's in there is just just amazing, um, especially for comics in, in 1990, you know? <laughs> well, I... I always look, you know, at, at the magic of Stan Lee. And I think that a lot of people um, misunderstood what, what Stan had brought to comics. Because, you know, every article about Stan, they talk about how he brought in Cap 
characters with feet of clay um, that had problems. And yeah, you know, you know, there was a lot of that in, in Marvel, but he wasn't the first guy to, to do that sort of thing. With, with Stanley's magic, what his real gift to comics was, he brought soap opera to comics. Yeah. He made us care about the characters' personal lives. We, we, you know, got fully invested in Spider-Man, Peter Parker's daily life, who he was dating, his problems with his aunt, you know, you know, whether or not the thing would ever be able to uh, have the courage to ask Alicia out. All these, you know, soap opera elements that he brought in, in into comics, and I think that. Uh, you know, Ron and I, we, we, we did our best to, you know, heighten up the soap opera and, and get people to care about the characters. Uh, Ron and I have always believed that when, when we are doing our best work, we are totally invisible. Huh. Um, you know, as you're reading the story, you get so sucked into the story that, you know, you, you, you think of them, these characters as real people. And that that's really our job, to make you look at these, you know, goofy, ridiculous, larger than life characters and see them as real people and, and to care about, you know, the traumas that they're going through. Um, and, you know, Ron and I, you know, care very deeply about, you know, what was going on with Eric and his personal life and Thor and his personal life. And because, because if we don't care, you're not going to care. So, you know. And it was such a new approach to Thor to ground him in in that type of drama. Like, you know, Thor and Jane were always like, there was drama there and there was drama in Asgard and stuff like that. But for it to be on such a human level was, I think, I feel a new approach to the character. And it worked. It, it totally, <laughs> oh, thank it, you. It totally worked. We, I, you know, we, we, we really worked hard on that stuff. Can I uh, pick your brain about Eric Masterson a little bit since I was such a fanboy for him? Sure. <laughs> uh, was he based on anybody or was he? I'll just he, let you talk. <laughs> he was, uh, Eric Masterson was um, the, the, the best traits that Ron and I wish we had. So um, we, we tried to make him the, you know, the person that we wished we could be. Right. And, um, and somebody that, you know, since since we knew we were going to spend a lot of hours with him, we wanted to make him somebody that we, you know, really liked and, and really cared about. Oh. Um, ne neither Ron nor I uh, can read his his final appearance um, <laughs> without bursting into tears. <laughs> It, it was it was great the um his his sacrifice and and thunderstrike um yeah that that was amazing stuff did you have that in mind and by the way well, jason i'm sorry I, i'm just like you're fine to Falco. You're right. go for it go for it you were fine we always knew that eric's story was going to end tragically um you know we planted you know, clue after clue in, in, in the in the series. And, um, you know, I, I kept thinking, are we being too heavy-handed? I don't think any of the readers noticed the clues. Um, there, there was, you know, one clue which I thought, okay, all right, we just gave, gave away the end of what happens to Eric. And um, there was a time when uh, the Thors from different time eras yep. were uh, all together. And um, the, the Thor from the, the, the future, um, uh, I, I, he's, he's busting Eric's chops from beginning to end. And then uh, at some point he sees a, a screen, a time thing. And we don't see what he's see, seeing. Um, but from that moment on, he's very nice to Eric. And uh, when he when he says goodbye to Eric, he says, "Treasure every moment," um, because he he saw Eric's death. Um, and, and I and Ron and I, you know, we're going to do we just give away <laughs> the ending? <laughs> and we're waiting for you know readers to you know uh, call us on it, but nobody ever did. So we, we were very lucky in that regard. Um, 
I listened to you and Mr. Friends on the Epic Marvel podcast. I don't know if you remember doing that with uh, Curtis Finley. And, and you talked about that line uh, that enjoy every moment of it on that podcast. And I was like, and it, it did slip by me when I was a kid. And I was like, no, they didn't do that, did they? And I went back and read it. And like you say, it, it was such a such a huge moment knowing how his story was going to play out. It was uh, it was subtle, yet once once it all played out, it was it was an amazing moment. It was great. Well, we we like I said, we we knew we you know we constructed the character very carefully. Um, you know, Thor Thor is a warrior who, in the course of his you know, in his daily life, this creates a lot of destruction. So we wanted somebody that was kind of the opposite of them. You know, Eric, an architect. You know, he, he's building buildings which Thor is ultimately destroying. <laughs> um, and we, you know, decided to put in, you know, make him a single father, and you know, deal with some of those issues because um, we we hadn't seen them before. In comics, and you know, we, we, we were, Ron and I are always interested in, in uh, you know, you know, plowing new, new fields, yeah. which is, which is why you know when we got anytime we got on a book, we, we would always get a lot of complaint from the regular readers because we didn't go through the standard villains. <laughs> we were always creating new villains. Like, hey, you, you want the same old villains? Read somebody else's stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but you know all the new villains work they were all a challenge for eric masterson since he didn't really know what he was doing there uh for for several issues you know it took him a while to find his feet as a hero find his... <laughs> yeah and and ron and i were always very very serious about our covers um where we had one where eric is holding a giant gun yep and it says no more mr nice god Mm -hmm. Boy, did... <laughs> so many readers wrote in to tell us you obviously don't understand Thor and, and his characterization. <laughs> and we're thinking, did you read the comic book? He 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 picks up this thing and realizes I don't know how to operate this thing, and he throws it away. <laughs> yep, I re I remember that issue. Who um, was it? A collaboration, or since he was the artist, was it more Mister Friends who kind of designed? The overall look of either Thunderstrike or the Eric Masterson Thor with the helmet, because the the helmet on the Eric Masterson Thor, I think, is like one of the best details of any hero ever. I, I love his rendition of it. It just it was awesome. It was wonderful. Ron is the visual guy. Okay. You know, sometimes he would, you know, piss in front of me and say, "What do you think?" And I'd go, "It's great." <laughs> <laughs> but but you know, uh, the visuals. Uh, you know, all Ron. Now, here's an aggravating thing about Ron Friends. <laughs> all right? Time and time again, I, I work out a, an interesting visual bit, you know, a, a nice sequence of action. I put it in the plot, and Ron reads it. He says, that, that was terrific. But how about instead we do this? And his ideas are always better than mine. And I think that's very disrespectful. I mean, you know, the guy should... You know, cut me some slack. Right, right. <laughs> That's funny. Um, well, I could talk about Eric Masterson all day, uh, but I feel like I'm hogging this, Jason. Uh, what are some questions you want to get in here for Mr. DeFalco? Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, just kind of following up there with talking about the changes that you brought to these characters uh, and curious about, uh, you said that you were a person that liked to have the end of the story in mind. So it sounds like those were intentional choices. Uh, were there times where you just kind of followed the path as the writer and some of these changes in the story just kind of came up as you went? Um, yeah. You know, like I said, you have to be open to what's happening. Um, I, I, I always remember, you know, once... One time the characters took over the storyline. When Ron and I were working on Spider-Man, yeah, um, we had a, a sequence where the uh, Mary Jane is in the apart Peter's apartment, and the puma bursts in, mm -hmm. and and 
Peter Parker, you know, hustles Mary Jane out and then changes into his costume, fights the Puma, that sort of stuff. And then the next issue, we had an explanation that Peter was going to give to Mary Jane as to why the, the Puma burst into his apartment. And um, we, we, we had that explanation and we knew what the next two or three issues were going to be. And uh, as, as I was typing the plot, as I got to the, the point that uh, Peter started to give his explanation, um, I had, you know, started typing. Mary Jane says, uh, you know, enough, Peter. I know, you know, I, I know you're Spider-Man. I've always known. <laughs> and, I, and I remember I, I stopped for a second, thought, where the heck did that come from? <laughs> uh, but it, it just naturally flowed out. Uh, so the character, you know, Mary Jane decided she knew who, who Peter Parker was. And, um, and I remember calling up Ron. And Ron said, we can't do that. And then he thought about it. He says, you know what? No. Now, now that you mention it, it makes sense that she's always known. And then he came up with two or three examples proving over the years that she had known. And, um, you know, we proposed it to the editor who had the same reaction. No, no. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. And then we proposed it to Jim Shooter, who again said, well, that explains why in, in, in such and such issue she did this and, and why she ran away from it here and um, and you know, and, and the editor said, "Yeah, we're going to go with it this way." And then Ron and I looked at each other and said, "Our next three issues, we have to throw out everything we had. <laughs> it doesn't follow this anymore." And you know that, like I say, you have to be, you have to have a path, but you have to understand when it's time to veer from that path. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, so much of, you know, writing is about craft. Uh, and, and you've heard this thing, structure, structure, structure. You've got to keep your structure. Um, and a lot of times you come up with these great scenes um, that don't fit the structure. So you have to throw them out. You know, or you can lie to yourself, which... I think we all we all often do is we we cut and paste it onto another document, thinking I, I will use that later. <laughs> but but if you're you know really deeply involved in your stories, that that scene will never fit into anything properly mm -hmm. later. So you you know, like I said, we all have to lie to each other, <laughs> uh, lie to ourselves, and say, yeah, I'll save. I'll save that 50 pages of text that I just did where I made a wrong turn. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not just going to delete the whole thing. I'll, you know, put it off in another document, which I'll delete later. But <laughs> I'm sure moments like that uh, were probably things that you thought about as an editor uh, on that side of the typewriter as well as you're working with creative talent. Yeah, it's, you know, it, it's all one one thing with me being an editor, being a writer and stuff like that. I, I am, I'm lucky cause I, I understand, you know, both sides of the fence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, and I also understand the natural conflict between an editor and a writer. Um, an editor has to think long-term what is best for this character and a writer thinks short-term what is best for my story. Um, and sometimes, you know, the editors and the writers end up shouting at each other because, hey, I got this great story. You know, I, I remember a guy saying, yeah, I have this great story. Spider-Man loses one of his arms. And, you know, all, all this, you know, emotional stuff going on and blah, blah, blah. And I said, okay, um, how does he web swing after that? You know, what happens next? Oh, I, 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 I'm not going to do the next next issue. Well, you may not care about the next issue, but I do. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I, I've said this, you know, time and time again, it's when I was editor-in-chief, at least once a month, somebody who had never written a Spider-Man story before showed up and said, I've got a great idea for a Spider-Man story. We kill, F, we kill off Aunt May. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, and then? And there was never an 
you know, an answer to that. Yeah. As, as an editor in chief, did you have like a grand vision for where each book should be going or how did that work as editor in chief in your vision of Marvel? As, as editor in chief, my vision was I was going to hire a bunch of different editors with different sensibilities and get a whole bunch of different kinds of comics. Um, I, I didn't think, you know, one vision was good enough for Marvel. I thought, I thought we needed, you know, many visions. Um, I, I, you know, I believed in, you know, uh, you know, that creativity comes from the ground upward and, uh, you know, I'm no great genius. So <laughs> why, why, why would I stick, you know, my opinions on everybody else? It just didn't make any sense to me. Um, so. That's, that's one thing I've always said about comics is, um, you can be a fan of anything and find it in comics. You know, you can find that family dynamic in Fantastic Four. You can find larger than life stories with Thor, ground level stories, street level stories with like Spider-Man or Daredevil. Like it's all there. Like any type of storytelling uh, you're interested in, you can find it in, in Marvel <laughs> specifically. Yeah. Yeah, well, that, you know, we, we were, trying to appeal to a lot of tastes, you know, a lot of, a lot of audiences. Can I ask you, um, so I've, you know, already been a fanboy with the Eric Masterson Thor, and we've mentioned the Spider-Man, which I loved your Spider-Man run too, but I also really, really loved you and Paul Ryan on Fantastic Four. That was well, I'll start to say that's fantastic. It, it was that fantastic. Was, yeah. <laughs> <that> was, uh, <laughs> uh, what was it like working with Paul Ryan? Well, uh, Paul, um, he he was this sweet, quiet guy who could <laughs> pretty well draw anything, and um, and and you know we, he came up with some really crazy stuff. <laughs> Um, during our Fantastic Four run, you know, the world between atoms, um, you know, outer space stuff, uh, you know, all sorts of different monsters and creatures, and and Paul, you know, he never never batted up an eye. Um, he he, you know, he just sat down and and, and drew things and just, um, you know, he. he he, he was a, just a great collaborator. Um, Paul, Paul um, the only thing I found interesting with Paul was that uh, he he always wanted to have two plots on his desk, uh, aside from the one he was drawing. He's, he's drawing one, and he needed two the next two issues on his desk. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, so uh, I always had to work, you know, much further ahead with Paul than I, I did with anybody else, and. And our uh, our Fantastic Four run was, man, you know, you know, most of the time I keep a chart, would keep a chart on where where all the subplots were going for for uh, uh, characters. But with the Fantastic Four, the chart <laughs> went up, 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 up towards the you know the ceiling, down towards the floor, branched off this way, that way. Mm -hmm. um, we were, uh, you know. Our, our goal when we took it over is I, I said to Paul, we want to be the wildest roller coaster ride in comics. <laughs> um, and, our, and our goal was that every issue we were going to, you know, I, I think the comics were 22 pages that at the time, that every issue we we're going to have a complete story and then we're going to set up next issue. So it's going to seem like it's one un, unending story, even though, even though each issue was a complete unit of entertainment. Um, and uh, uh, it was a wild roller coaster ride. I, uh, you know, in those days, a lot of times we, we were getting, you know, the worst reviews in creation. People were saying, "Oh, this 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 book is terrible." It's, you know, they don't understand the characters. They're, you know, it's, it's you know, one one unending problem after the next. And I 
and I spoke to a guy who was doing reviews every month. And I said, listen, with all the comic books out there, why do you, you know, why do you keep, uh, you know, why, why do you, you, you obviously hate what we're doing. Why do you read it every issue? And he said to me, because I have to know what, what happens next. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, uh, and I'll run on Fantastic Four. Um, you know, pretty much every issue, the sales got better. Yeah. They, 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 they started climbing and they kept climbing. The, the only exception is 401 did not sell as well as 402. But 40, uh, 401 did not sell as well as 400. 400 oh. you know, really exploded. But 402 outsold 401. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we kept going up there. Um, and, uh, and, and we tried to defy exp expectations. There was a, a time where it, it looked like we had killed Reed Richards and Dr. Doom. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. And of course, everybody assumed that uh, in issue 400, Reed Richards is coming back. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, we didn't do it that way. Uh, no. four, 400 was the <laughs> issue where Sue, who up until now would not accept the fact that Reed was dead. In 400, she finally accepted the fact that, that Reed was dead. They had a memorial service, that sort of stuff. Um, readers were outraged <laughs> because they thought, you know, Everybody thought, for sure, Reed is coming back at 400. And I think we brought him back in four, 404, 405, something like that. He said, hey, well, <laughs> bring him back when nobody's expected him. Love that, love that. Your, your fantastic four issues. I was uh, flipping through those again, you know, in preparation for this. And I just noticed you, you made the comment that, you know, each comic was kind of like its own unit of entertainment that would then go into the next one. But each page was so dense and I mean that in the most positive way ever because um, his art and, and your writing, it was just so chocked full of details and it was just, it was such dense, uh, start to say fantastic again, <laughs> wonderful storytelling. <laughs> it, it really was like it, it was an issue that you could read and reread and get something new each time. Um, it was, it was just great storytelling. Well, you know, that's what me and the team, you know, what, what we always try to do is, you know, we are an incredible imposition on our readers. You know, we're, we're demanding two important things from the readers. Money, um, which they can always get new money, and time, which they can never get back. Mm. So we really have to be worth the reader's time. So we we, we tried to stuff our stories because um, we, you know, we, we might not get a second chance to lure yeah. you back. Um, uh, I love the ensemble kind of aspect of the Fantastic Four and, and X-Men is much the same in some ways. Uh, did you have a character in in that team that you enjoyed kind of getting inside the mind of the most? Well, um, the character I, I, you know, most identified with was Ben. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, at one point I was writing a, a, it was a Marvel 2-in-1 uh, that's, that starred Ben. And uh, I mean, Jim Shooter at one point came up to me and said, are you writing a comic book or an autobiography here? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, Ben and I shared uh, uh, a lot of traits. Yeah, yeah, such a great character. Such a great character. Yeah. Um, I was going to pick your brain about something else if you if you still have the time. Um, just sure. your, love, your love of uh, Pogo. Pogo? Yeah. 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 I, I heard that in another interview where you said that that's one of the things that got you into, into comics. I just wondered what your, you know, from your angle, what was the fascination with, with Pogo? There are just too many <laughs> facets with Pogo because it, um, brilliant, brilliant writing, um, very sarcastic writing, yeah. Um, incredibly beautiful artwork. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at how how lush the uh, swamp was, how you know how 
you know, how the characters were, were portrayed and the characterization was fabulous. I, you know, I, I you always use an, you know, an Albert the Alligator line, you know, a handsome man looks good in anything. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and it applies to me as much as it did Albert. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, th th there's just so much brilliance in, in the Pogo comic strip. So. This, this is probably a, a very random question to ask, but were you maybe a fan of Calvin and Hobbes as well? Since Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that was the true successor to Pogo. Yeah. Even, you know, though the subject matter was, you know, completely different, but yeah, yeah, I loved it. Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, you know, I, Pogo, Pogo, I started as a kid. Calvin and Hobbes is an adult. Yeah, I, I was. I read Calvin and Hobbes when it was coming out, and I was such a huge, huge fan of it. And I thought, you know, he had created all his little um, story beats on his own. But then, when I went back, because I kept seeing something about Pogo, but I didn't have access to it as a kid. And then finally I got the access. And I'm looking back through Pogo, and, you know, one of the Calvin and Hobbes bits was the uh, wagon, that they would always ride in the wagon. But then I'm flipping through Pogo, and there is basically uh, a wagon and two of the characters in the wagon. I was like, okay, all right. So, yeah, the, the, it truly is inspired by, by Walt Kelly and, and Pogo. Well, yeah, but you can't take anything away from uh, uh, Bill Watterson. He, he, you know, he uh, just an incredible talent, uh, you know, an incredible artist, a brilliant writer. You know, yeah. it, it, there are so, so many incredibly talented cartoonists, you know, out there that uh, you know, they, they just take my breath away. I, you know, I just, uh, you know, the Mutz comic strip, mm -hmm. brilliant, Love brilliant. That. So, you know, so many, you know, I'm such a fan of so much of this stuff that it's, yeah. uh, you know. And that's one thing I've noticed at, at Heroes Con is just, you just go there to kind of absorb. <laughs> like there's just so many talented writers and cartoonists and illustrators on every row. Um, you can just wander there. It's a three day event, but it, you could spend, I could spend a month there <laughs> e easily. If you were to go back now and, and revisit or visit for the first time, any Marvel character or storyline, what would it be? And the second part is any, anything that you'd like to mention that you're working on right now before we close out. Um, uh, re re revisit a storyline. Or revisit a character, revisit a particular world. Um, Would you go back to Thor? Well, I, I, as, as Thor has changed so much since yeah. mm -hmm. you know since I've been there. Um, Spider Man has changed so much, uh, and I, I I have to confess I am not up to date on either either character. Um, so I I. I, I it probably wouldn't be appropriate for me to deal with either one of those characters. Um, Cause I, I always think that with, you know, a comic book, you should always move forward. So if, if they called me up and said, Hey, you want to take over a Spider-Man book? I I'd, I'd have to read, you know, read the last, you know, two or three years worth of Spider-Man just to catch up to date so that, so that I, you know, would move forward on, on the character. Um, you know, a, a character that Ron and I um, only played with a couple of times, Captain America. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we always had a, you know, uh, you know, a, a desire to do Captain America. At one, one point, the, the title was offered to us, but neither one of us could leave Eric at the time. Um, yeah. And we would have had to have left uh, Eric Masters <clears throat> and we, you know, we couldn't do it. Um, I think the only character that I could go back to at this stage is probably Spider Girl because there's only been maybe a, a half a dozen, a dozen stories written about Spider Girl since I've left. Mm -hmm. um, but th that's one title that I probably wouldn't be allowed to do anymore because, um, you know, it's a female character. Only females can write female characters. <laughs> but females can write The Punisher. That, that, 
I don't I don't get that. But anyway, what do I know? <laughs> and, and you had a hand in creating that character as well. So <laughs> yeah, you know what, what what can I say? I'm, <laughs> I I understand that uh, um, you know uh, the the world has changed on how they give out assignments and stuff like that. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know that you know that's the biz. It, it moves on. Um, uh, you know, in terms of things that Ron and I are doing, we uh, came out with something called the Right Project uh, as a Kickstarter. We did the first issue, and and now we're, you know, work, working on the second issue. And what I left and we referred to as our part, you know, our spare time. <laughs> um, I, um, and that's, you know, basically it with comics. Uh, this week, this week I'm out of comics. Um, yeah, I don't know what what's going to happen next week. There's always a chance that you know Archie will call me up and ask me to do a digest story, or Marvel will need a five page story, and and they don't know anybody else who can do five page stories. Uh, <laughs> uh, so you know, I, I I never know where the future is, you know what, what it's going to be, but I'm always you know open to things if. If, if an assignment looks interesting, I'll, I'll grab it. If it doesn't look interesting, I, you know, I pass. Yeah. Um, I'm, 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 a, I'm a very lucky guy. Um, I'm just a very lucky guy. Uh, I don't have to, you know, worry about the, the next assignment. You know, certainly not in comics. Yeah. You know, and, um, and I'm lucky because I, I, I can do other things than comics. Which is the one piece of advice I offer to everybody who wants to be a writer. Be a writer first. <laughs> a guy who does comics, that, that's just one of your talents. Because, you know, this week, uh, you know, you can get hired to do comic books. Next week, you can only be hired to do Netflix shows. Week after that, you know, you got to work on a prose novel. <laughs> you you, you, you got to be flexible. You got to you know, hone your talents. Um, and there, there is only one secret to writing. And I, I tell this to everybody. You have to care and care passionately about whatever you're writing. If you're writing a one-page joke for Archie, you really have to believe that this joke must be told. <laughs> and, it, and if you're writing, you know, a Spider-Man story, that you're, you're telling a story that is very important to Spider-Man. Because if it isn't, if you don't care, your readers won't either. So you must care about what you're doing. Well, that sounds like fantastic advice. And I don't know if there's a better way to, to wrap up our discussion than that. That's, uh, that's a great way to do it. We, uh, we really appreciate the time that you've given us today. And like I say, it's, it's, been, a, it's been a real honor to talk to you about these characters that you wrote that I love and that we love. Jason and I love so uh, it's and I love great. too <laughs> yeah. and I love how that comes through as well I love the commitment to characters and well, stories you, you have to love your characters you have to love your characters because you, you know you're spending a lot of time with them yeah yeah absolutely all right guys Th thank you very much I really appreciate it thanks for being there absolutely thank, thank you so much thank, thank you thank you